You need to make sure that you're solving a specific problem. You need to make sure you're scratching an itch that you have. The biggest reward comes from doing things that nobody else is doing, and that goes with this as well. This is Lena Chong, back at it again with Multi-Channel Millionaire. Today, we've got a superstar seller turned tech founder, Chad Rubin. Over 10 years ago, Rubin was laid off from his Wall Street job just two weeks after he proposed to his then girlfriend. But thanks to the hustle, he went from zero to 20 million in just seven years. He then co-founded Skubana and Think Crucial. And today, I'm really excited that I'm going to pick his brain on a few things how he succeeded growing his parents' vacuum cleaner business, how to build a brand that people actually care about, and then talk about his biggest mistakes. About a decade ago, I was laid off of Wall Street in the Great Recession. My parents owned a vacuum store while I was growing up, always struggling to sell the next vacuum. I don't know if you've been to a vacuum store recently, you like, unlikely have. Uh, and so I, yeah, so I helped them bring their store online and we were reselling. So reselling products in their store, we were embracing Amazon, embracing many other channels, and um, my father passes away, and then I decided to start Think Crucial. Initially, it was called Crucial Vacuum. So we were making just vacuum replacement parts, direct to consumers, selling just like Warby Parker, cutting out the middleman. And then we started expanding into many other categories. So we now make air purifier filters, coffee filters, cannabis filters, you name it. We make it anything that's crucial in the home. What's the first product that you put online? First product that we invested in was a vacuum filter. We manufacture replacement filters to fit mm -hmm. the OEM filter. So we made a Hoover, Hoover vacuum filter early on. And that product has been seriously commoditized in the past 10 years. And how do, how do you stay passionate about vacuums? Well, you don't. You kind, of, you kind of take what you know about and then you form it into a passion. So initially, like I mentioned, we were Crucial Vacuum. And then I was like, okay... I want to make other things and I'm really into coffee. So combining like what you know with what you're passionate about, I think that's there's a really like healthy mix there. We started making coffee filters like for the Chemex or AeroPress. Uh, and that's where I have more of a passion. I'm more of a builder than anything else. So I think the passion is in like building and creating things and coming up with these new ideas that are fresh and watching them to success. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, and I think that is... Definitely a knowledge hole within sellers at Deliver, just being able to create something that's new. And your coffee filters are actually washable and reusable. And that's something that coffee filters usually aren't. To be honest with you, I'm not a huge coffee drinker myself, but I'm wondering how do you find such a point of differentiation in a common product that people use every day? Yeah, that's a great question. So initially, we the idea was we were, gonna, we were planting trees for every filter that was sold along with making them washable and reusable. And we started off in vacuum filters doing it and then coffee. And the idea was just like, why do you need to change something if you can just wash it and replace it? Sort of stopping this consumer behavior of, uh, of just replacing items. So how did we find the idea? I mean, we came across this idea just by like, I was think thinking about like, where are there problems that I could be solving for? And once you have a problem you can solve for, I think that's imperative, right? You need to have a problem that you can solve for. And that's where essentially that'll lead to a big outcome for yourself. Right. And kind of how how much, like, can you ballpark did you and kind of invest into that specific feature? We're always doubling down and reinvesting back in the business. So even for the first couple of years at Think Crucial, I didn't take any money off the table. I didn't take a distribution. It was just taking money, reinvesting it back into the business to scale and if you look at it today, we have roughly about 800 of our own branded products. That is a massive SKU assortment. And that's not including kits and bundles to increase our AOV. Uh, and also just like if someone's buying a vacuum filter, they might buy a hose with it or a belt. So we're creating service kits and making all these different kits to increase our AOV and drive more profit to, to the bottom line. Right. So you took vacuum cleaners and then you expanded into over... How many different SKUs would you say for home replacement parts in general? We have 800 now. 800. So let's go back to the very beginning with vacuums. You started there, you started producing vacuum filters. So what was your expansion strategy? 
if you were to go back to the very beginning? Expand in terms of just like marketplaces or SKUs or all of the above? Let's start with SKUs. Expansion, expansion strategy was, well, thinking back to those days, Amazon was really the wild, wild west. So there were a lot less sellers. So right now today, there's about 5 million Amazon sellers. And so the competition was a lot less. And I can see the demand that's being leveraged on Amazon and see where there's inefficiencies of the listings themselves in the pricing, in the quality of the product. And we're able to capitalize on that really early on. So that, that was our initial approach was, okay, this is a hot selling vacuum. Let's make the replacement filter to fit that hot selling vacuum. All right, what's the next best selling vacuum on Amazon? Let's make that filter and let's cut the price in half or more than half. What was your marketplace strategy? So what, let's start with this. What marketplace or sales channel did you start on? So initially when I built the site for my parents, we were using uh, Volusion, which is now bankrupt. Uh, we also embraced eBay and Amazon. Those were the three channels that we embraced early on. Mm -hmm. So what was your expansion strategy in terms of marketplaces? Marketplaces for me, and I say this often, I think it's really, really important is I go after where people are spending time. And uh, I look at e-commerce like playing Monopoly. So you want to be on every piece of the board to win. You want to be on Park Ave. You want to own the utilities. And so like if Amazon is driving product eyeballs, but then people are still leveraging Google and people are still on eBay, and then eBay then can post ads to Google, I just want to take as much market share space or eyeball space as possible so I can capture as much market share as possible. And so that was really the strategy is to be everywhere I possibly can. So you fast forward to today, we're on about 10 different channels uh, across the internet. Okay. So 10 different sales channels like Amazon, eBay, those kind of channels? Yeah. Wayfair, Overstock, Walmart, Home Depot, Groupon, et cetera. Yeah. That's very interesting that you kind of compare this to a monopoly game. So you used to work on Wall Street and you mentioned that. So that's a very, very different line of work. Did that in any way prep you for e-commerce? I mean, just seeing the volatility of the stock market, do you think that you treated your business like a stock? So, I, okay, that's a great question. Number one is I covered internet stocks on Wall Street. So I was covering Amazon. So I saw that in a recession, in the Great Recession, 2009, Amazon was a great place to put your money. In fact, people started doubling down on Amazon because of its convenience and because of the price. Fast forward, then I started modeling out my business and forecasting and demand planning using a lot of the spreadsheet skills that I acquired working on the street. And then lastly, as uh, you know, I was in equity research, so I would advise institutional investors to buy, sell, or short various stocks. I would never advise somebody to put all their eggs in one basket. And I initially actually did that with my own business, right? I had my eggs all in Amazon. A lot of it, the eggs were in Amazon's basket until we started to diversify away from it. So we view Amazon as not a business, but we view Amazon as just merely a channel. And how long have you been selling now? Uh, you said close to a decade? It's been over a decade, as you can tell by the, the hair loss on top. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's definitely been a wild adventure and certainly a very fruitful one. But yeah, it's been, it's been a really long time, uh, over a decade. And obviously, I started out of that pain of really, it's all about solving problems. So out of that pain, I was on the initial... Uh, committee that formed the Prosper Show, which is an Amazon sellers conference, which was acquired. And then we, we also started Stubana, which is an operations platform, as you've mentioned, out of the pain of trying to find something as a merchant brand myself, I couldn't find something out there that existed. So I went ahead and started building it with my business partner, DJ. Yeah, that's a really long time, um, just over decades. So I'm sure you've made some mistakes along the way. Can you tell me some stories or just provide me some examples of mistakes that you've made and you wish you could kind of go back and erase that? Gosh, so many mistakes. Uh, every day I wake up a little smarter and it's all about surrounding yourself with the right people. Uh, but in terms of selling, uh, we, gosh, a lot of things. I mean, look, I started Definitely running two businesses has been, was challenging initially to try to figure that out, right? Most people have a hard time starting just running one business. God bless Jack Dorsey for, for running two as well. Uh, so I think also perhaps 
uh, not innovating as fast as we possibly can, like sitting on certain products. Like, you know, if you look at someone like Apple, Apple came out with the first smartphone and they had to keep on moving to the five, the six, the seven. Maybe they didn't do a seven, maybe did an eight or nine. They skipped around the numbers, but regardless, they had to keep on innovating, keep on moving because somebody was always on their on their tail. Uh, and so, and there's always copycats around specifically as uh, in the e-commerce world where there's a, the competitive mode is like really low on certain branded SKUs. So perhaps moving into competitive moats in a quicker time frame probably would have been the first piece of advice that I would, I wish I knew than what I know now. Were there any inefficiencies within the first iteration of your business that you had to cut out? So I read in a previous interview that you did that you um, just kind of went straight to the factories in China, kind of discussed with people there. How do you um, decide when to cut the middleman out and take more of that profit for yourself? Well, so I, I started seeing Bonobos or Warby Parker doing it, and I was like, oh, this makes sense. Like, there needs to be more of a one to one connection with the consumer. And so I think when you start seeing, like when you start exploring, okay, here's a problem that needs to be solved. So you start reading reviews or you start hearing or walking through your daily life and finding those problems. So that's like really the starting point. And then as you start to explore and find factories and sourcing factories and products, you start figuring out, wait a minute, this costs how much? It costs 10 cents and they're selling it for $80. That's crazy. So the markups are incredibly high. And that's where I think you can, that's where it's like you have that cha-ching moment and you're like, okay, there's a really an opportunity here. Now, other inefficiencies, by the way, those are just like selling inefficiencies where you know that there's an addressable market that you can capture. I would say the next step is the inefficiencies of running. When I first started, I had my own warehouse and I was, I had, first of all, I had no business running my own warehouse. I never had done it before. And, um, managing the warehouse and creating picking locations and all, all the things that went along with it. I mean, I we had huge high turnover um, located in New York, which you know, it's, it's pretty expensive to find warehouse employees that want to work. And um, we didn't do any background checks on top of it. So we early on made a decision before any 3PL was created to outsource our warehouse. And that was non-consensus at the time and super risky. And it turned out to be one of the best decisions I'd made. How did you kind of come about that decision to kind of take on that feat of having your own warehouse? Oh, to take it on? Well, I had no choice. So business started to explode and we were, I was working out of my apartment on the Upper West Side in New York City started to fulfill out of there. Boxes were piling up. And my girlfriend, now my wife at the time, was like, dude, you need to like find a space. So we found a, a storage space in Harlem. And I started working out of there. There was no windows in this space. It was insane. And then I started growing out of that. And we moved into a, an actual warehouse in New Jersey in Little Ferry. And uh, so we experienced those growing pains. But then like there was all these other growing pains, like we couldn't manage inventory and stock and I couldn't manage the employees and things were falling apart and all these things that were happening, the stress and the anxiety, I was like, okay, there needs to be a better way. And that's how we found our first 3PL. Okay. Uh, let's discuss building a D2C brand in a typically unbranded market. So you're currently selling replacement parts of the home in general. Can you walk me through how you decided to build a brand around such a traditionally, I guess, unsexy market? I mean, let's, let me think back. Uh, it, it, it all came like so quickly and happened. Like we came up with the name, which was Crucial Vacuum. We came up with a logo and I found a freelancer to make the logo. We, I knew that I wanted to have our own website, not just be on Amazon. So we started developing our own website. Uh, and those, that took many iterations. Uh, and yeah, you're, you're right. Our category isn't really sexy, even though, by the way, I think coffee filters or sometimes cannabis filters could be considered sexy. But a lot of times, like the, the riches are in the niches or the, the non-sexy categories that nobody wants to touch. And that could be a big uh, wealth generator if you embrace it. So I think that the secret in our space, in the in the filter replacement space, is that it's 
the replacement product. So we're essentially letting the, the Hoovers of the world or the Dysons of the world do the marketing for the vacuums and going on QVC and doing all the hard work. And we're, we're doing the dirty work, which is like, let's just make the replacement filters, which need to be replaced. They need to do it often. There's a lot of recurring revenue there. And I think it's just a great market to capture. And did you guys eventually start doing the subscription model? Yep. So we do subscription. We do subscribe and save on Amazon. We have subscribe and save on our own website. Uh, and I think to fast forward now, though, that I was talking about like the idea of innovation and the idea of having a moat in e-commerce right now, like anybody right now can start a website. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago. Anybody right now can go on Alibaba and source a factory. That wasn't really the case 10 years ago. And so now the idea is, is that how do you develop something where there's a problem that needs to be solved, but you're also like really innovating and developing something that nobody else has. And that becomes your competitive moat because first mover advantage isn't an advantage anymore. There's a very short shelf life to that first mover advantage where there's copycats everywhere, especially in MySpace, my, not MySpace, the platform, MySpace, like our vertical that we're in. There's so many copycats. And uh, so like that's really where we're focusing most of our time now. We're constantly innovating and moving into like, we're manufacturing hoses and all these things that essentially have big capital uh, expenditures, expenditures associated with them so that we could have a moat. So when you talk about like copycats popping up, can you tell me a specific story of you're coming out with a product and then you see something popping up around six months later. What was that like? How did you combat that? Yeah. So I always knew. So I always knew. So 10 years ago, I was like, oh my God, this is such a great opportunity on Amazon. And uh, I always knew that there, I, or I always had this, I was always like looking back in the rearview mirror being like, whoa, this person's going to do this or someone's going to do this. Someone's going to like catch on to this. And it took a lot longer than I expected to be, to be frank. And it wasn't until I think like there sort of, it became public. Like even my mom knows about selling on Amazon now. Like everybody knows about selling on Amazon. And that's actually where you're like, hmm, maybe there's some, maybe there's a different opportunity you want to move into. Like anytime that happens, like when everyone's crowding a space, that's the greatest time to move out of the space. And that's why you're seeing right now, a lot of people selling their Amazon businesses. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's specifically answering your question, but um, what was your question? Sorry, I digress. <laughs> I think my question was more so around like copycats. Tell me a story about, you know, you built something, you were really proud of it. And then six months later, you saw something pop up on Amazon. How do you combat that? And can you even do anything about it? Yeah. Uh, hmm. There's nothing really to do. You need to make sure you have a long-term strategy in place. So like short-term strategies are quickly replaced with short-term products on Amazon. And it comes down to who has the best image, who has the best PPC spend, who uh, has, there's all these knockoffs that are created. And yes, that happens all the time. And so it just comes down to the long-term strategy, right? And like the idea is that these copycats, they, they're able to learn from your mistakes, which is awesome, right? So you're paving the path. If you're the innovator and you have the first mover advantage, they're like, wait a minute, I can do this better. Look at these reviews or look at this image or look at this title. I can do it one up better and I can put more money towards it. So you have to constantly be in innovating. The problem with those copycats, those copycats uh, is that they actually don't have any future insight or vision into the future of where they want to go or where they want to be. They're just copying you. So they're always following your footsteps. And I think that's where we've been able to do really well at, at Think Crucial is be, we've been able to innovate really quickly and have a direction of where we want to go. So can you sort of just define copycats? Are you saying they're going to the manufacturers, they're kind of slapping their own name and brand on it? Yeah, yeah, that, that's precisely a copy. So it could be, uh, you know, the set of matches that is on my desk right now. It could be someone saying, hey, I, I see these matches on Amazon. I can do it better. I can make it cheaper. I can create a better listing. I can drive more PPC results to it. So copy has someone just like copies your product and comes out with the same identical one or something very similar to it. And even if you go to Amazon right now and you type in 
Allbird Shoes or Away Luggage or any of these brands, like everybody is experiencing this copycat phenomenon. Yeah. And have at any point were you also ever guilty of copying, essentially? Yeah. I mean, like, I think, uh, what do they say? The best form of imitation. No, the best form of flattery yeah. is imitation. So I think that's what it is. Yeah. So for sure, like even for even the idea, like the inception of Crucial Vacuum. The idea of it was cutting out the middleman, going direct to consumer, and planting a tree for everyone sold. Uh, that was, I mean, if you think about it, that was Warby, Warby Parker had that mission very early on in the day, right? So I just took that and made it better, right? It's kind of like taking a car and throwing some like really fly hydraulics on it and some like gold plated hubcaps. Like you can soup up the car and make it your own and modify it. And, uh, and that's what we did. And by like now, in, in our space, like the filters or vacuum space or whatever, like everybody is now selling the same product and the the differ, the delta between my listing and somebody else's listing is very, very slight. And w- what happens then is that compression happens on the price. It drives down your margin and you're like, there's no more money in this anymore. Let's move to the next thing. You've mentioned you're a marketer, you're a brand builder, and you're a great storyteller, as is evidenced by this podcast right now. So what's the importance of kind of going beyond like simply private label and building an actual brand that resonates with consumers? I mean, I don't know. I'm excited by building, right? So like I would have never just trademarked a name and threw it up on Amazon and just existed in that in that realm of reality. So I also, coming from Wall Street, I always thought about this idea of the exit. Right, the idea that if you want to br- build real value and you want to build real wealth and you want to build a sizable outcome, uh, the way to do that is to be super diversified, but also have a brand that you can lean into to grow and scale. And also, by the way, the other piece of it is like automation, uh, automating the business. So that's how we had to actually started Scubana was thinking about how do we automate the business and think about how do we drive revenue. And letting our employees do higher impact, higher value activities, and there's value in that for for buyers and for myself for lifestyle, as well as automation capabilities, along with the exit multiple at the end of the day. All of those things are factored in to drive a higher multiple. So, what are the negative aspects? Any drawbacks about building a brand that can that be used against you as well? Drawbacks to building a brand? Uh, I don't. I don't have it. I think it's hard, right? It's harder to build a brand. Like it's easy. It's easy to just go into and, and, and start doing FBA, right? You just get your products into Amazon. You throw some ads on it. You buy some inventory. Hopefully you're not buying garlic presses or, or toilet paper holders. And and so I think that's the easy route. And I think there's value that could be created there, but I think there's a ton of risk. And I think the harder thing is like, how do you build a brand off of Amazon and create a different kind of relationship with your customer. Mm -hmm. And what have you, so I'm saying negative as in like, what if you somehow get a bad rap, people started associating that with your brand? Um, What do people kind of do about that then? Like an example would be Uber and Travis. Is that something like that? Like that kind of relationship? Perhaps, or maybe you just start getting a ton of negative reviews about your coffee filters. They're like, oh, it you know, I try to reuse it and um, it didn't really work the second time. Well, actually, the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that people go to Amazon for reviews. So you'll know your reviews right away. And I think that's part of the one of the problems in D2C is that how do you trust when you're on Instagram and you're finding a really cool, I don't know, toy for your child, people are like, oh, that's a really cool video. I want to buy it. And a lot of times they don't even look at reviews. Sometimes they go to Amazon. It's not on Amazon. And uh I think that there's probably an opportunity there to solve for with reviews as it relates to like social discovery. But I think it's, it's the reviews actually come more, they're more widespread and more flagrant on Amazon than if you're actually building off your own site. Amazon has like this review engine. People already have a login. They're accustomed to leaving reviews on Amazon. Yeah. And how about like fake reviews? Like, do you think that that is kind of really crowding the Amazon space right now? Just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think fake reviews are everywhere. I mean, Amazon relies on people to trust their platform for the right reviews. And I think most people still can't tell the difference between a fake review or a real review. They see the number of reviews, they see the content of the reviews, and then they make the decision based on that. 
uh, unless unless it's a really expensive product. So I think people still trust Amazon's review, even though that there's tons of fake reviews on there and people gaming the, the, the system. Yeah. So what are the out of the box marketing tactics? What are the ones that you're employing right now for Think Crucial? For Think Crucial, let's do a, a fun one uh, that's top of mind. So we started making, uh, you know, vacuum bags, filters, coffee filters, you name it. During the whole pandemic, we started selling a, a crap ton of vacuum filter bag media. And I was like, wait, this is so interesting. Isn't this the same Melplo media that face masks are made out of? So what we did was we made, decided to make a donation. So I made a donation to a hospital nearby and it caught some attention online. And somebody reached out to me that's making masks in LA right now. And a really popular company called Headley and Bennett they make aprons and they make masks. They, they literally pivoted their entire factory to start making face masks. Really cool masks, by the way. And so we got connected and they were like, hey, do you want to have a, a joint venture here? And so we essentially just started working with them. to. We, so it's a whole new business segment for them and for us for face mask filters. So all of their face masks have a pocket and they drive business to our site for the filter mask media. So I think that's really cool collaboration that a lot of e-commerce merchants aren't doing today, which is how do you find adjacent verticals and categories that you can collaborate with and go to market with so it's a win-win for both of you, where you're both going after the same demographic, you both have a great product, and you can create that win-win in this partnership together. That's fascinating. So I I didn't know that's you said it's the same kind of material. You can kind of repurpose like a vacuum sort of filter vacuum bag with a face mask. To be very very clear, it's a HEPA filter uh, bag media. It's a bag. So some vacuum filters have uh, materials that you wouldn't want to breathe in, right? But the vacuum filter bag media, the HEPA media that we have, has no uh, nothing in it that would that would be problematic at all. It's the same exact filter media that these uh, KN95 masks are made out of. This Melpalone poly uh, po- uh, poly media. Anyway, so uh, we have a whole FAQ on it. Like we have a whole FAQ on it, but it's really, really, it was really fascinating what happened. And we started partnering with other companies that started discovering us. And this has just become a whole new bit. I mean, this has really driven a ton of success. Now, we would have never been able to do this if we didn't have our own website, if uh, I didn't make that donation. So there's this butterfly effect that happened just upon just having good karma, right? Reciprocity. I always believe in like reciprocity, but like I had my intention was like, hey, let me get this to to the people on the ground floor doing really hard work right now on the front lines of this pandemic. And uh, it just had a really nice impact on our business. That's awesome. Um And so you also sell, I know that I read an interview somewhere where you mentioned that you sell to Amazon as a vendor. So you were doing 1P. Are you doing this currently as well? We, so we've been hybrid for a really long time doing 1P, 3P. Uh, Initially, I was like super excited because like we had a category manager managing our account and Amazon started to outsource that a lot more. Uh, I think they couldn't handle all the the 1P brands and merchants. So essentially, I look at 1P, 3P. I look at 1P almost like an insurance policy. So like, God forbid anything were to happen, we have contacts there. We still can sell to Amazon versus selling on Amazon because Amazon can make decisions overnight that impact you uh, and uh, with no recourse. I'm kind of interested in this entire process. So you have to sell at wholesale pricing. That's automatically a decrease in margins. And you just don't have as much control over the customer experience, which as a brand marketer and someone who's really passionate about that doesn't really seem in line. So why did you why did you kind of go that route? And why are you still going that route right now? Well, so I initially went the route to hedge. It's really an insurance policy. But I do actually believe in the power of the 3P marketplace. As a seller, you get so much more control as you just mentioned. So you get to control your price. You get to have, so right now, if you're selling to Amazon, they control your price and they can constantly lower the price on you, et cetera. Uh, And you can quickly react to competitors on on the 3P side with the click of a button by just changing your price as you see other ASINs and being dynamic in the marketplace. So 
uh, that's a huge, and also you get to create your own create uh, relationship with the customer, one-to-one -one relationship with the customer. You get a whole lot more data from Amazon three piece out of things. Uh, so I'm a huge believer in the marketplace. I just, I, I want to create opportunity uh, for, for us just in case, God forbid, anything happens. Right. And speaking of things, just that things that happen overnight, um, you talked about previously how you've had bumps with Amazon too. And you were in one of your interviews, I think you said you were suspended the day after Christmas. So your account was suspended. You updated your credit card. Some something happened. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Can you kind of explain that situation? Because I think that's kind of insane, um, especially the day after Christmas. What did you kind of go through? Well, so by the way, I've been suspended a lot of times on Amazon. I mean, over the ten years, it could have been that we oversold a product, we uh, couldn't fulfill on our promise, uh, our three PL had an issue, and they couldn't fulfill things, and. So, so this time around, the most recent example, which was a couple of years ago, we changed our credit card the day after Christmas, the credit card expired. So we just updated our credit card. I had like, I didn't know what the consequence of this was going to be, but suddenly our entire account got shut down. Like it was, a, came as a complete shock. And Amazon, look, they have 50% of e-commerce market share right now. They're a near monopoly. They're a, still a big, big driver, even though we're diversified, they're still a big driver of our business. And so... Uh, we had to create a appeal, right? A plan of action and appeal the suspension. And uh, we still were with no response, nothing. Amazon's sort of like a black box. So at some point you just have to say like, F this and I'm going to do something that nobody, nobody does, which was literally, I went on LinkedIn and I started just messaging all the people in the specific department that could possibly help with like personalized messages, not like a spray and pray model, right? This is a personalized message that's sharing with them what's ex what we experienced, what happened, and like, if at all, they can possibly help us overcome this issue. And- You're messaging people at yes, Amazon. correct. Look, that, that, the biggest reward comes from doing things that nobody else is doing, and that goes with this as well. And so a few people, wrote back at Amazon. Some were like, hey, I'll look into this. Hey, I'll flag it. And then the next person was like, I got this. I don't want you to be experiencing this. You're absolutely right. Let me fix this right away. And that was after maybe a week or so, but it was like so much inner turmoil, right? My brain is spinning. Like, what can I do? And uh, we found our way out of it. Crazy times, crazy times. And like, but I can imagine this happens with a lot of other people where they're really dependent on Amazon. They've invested millions of dollars of inventory and this happens every like every second somebody is being in fact right now someone's being suspended how often so i guess my next question is i guess it was going to be do you see this often which is probably going to be yes but how often do you see them being suspended for may, maybe vague or kind of unchecked reasons and have you heard kind of any crazy stories about that i've heard lots of crazy stories i get emails all the time because we've posted at stubana we posted a blog on the suspension and like the play-by-play. -play. So like so many people are reaching out to me around it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I don't know if I necessarily have any advice outside of like, you got to take matters into your own hands, develop a really good plan of action uh, of how you're going to respond to the suspension, be super honest, detail it. Uh, I sometimes would escalate it to Jeff Bezos. And I also obviously went on LinkedIn and started doing a lot of messaging myself. Yeah. And I guess, like, what kind of mistakes do you see your clients at Scubana make on Amazon in general? Like, what's stopping people from getting the results that they they need to get to the next level? In terms of, like, just being suspended or just in general on Amazon? Just in general. I think it comes down to, well, if, I think the first piece is, like, making sure you're picking the right vertical. Then, like, as people are making, like, if you type in toilet paper a toilet paper holder into Amazon, there's like over 100,000 items that come up. And you need to make sure that you're not just another Me Too offering on Amazon. So like this whole copy cap, copy cap thing is like super real. And then Amazon can, by the way, algorithmically readjust you based on how you're not FBA in your product or how you're out of stock and you're no longer prime eligible. So like those are mistakes in themselves. But then from a category mistake or even a product mistake is like, putting 
being like, hey, I'm gonna, this is a cash cow. I'm gonna ride this out forever. And that's never the case. Like things change, the marketplace is dynamic. That's what makes it a marketplace. And you need to always be on to the next innovative item or else you're gonna die. You can't just just stay stagnant. Yeah, you have to constantly kind of shape your strategy and keep changing. I was just gonna say the last thing is PPC. I think that's really important. Like those that are first generation sellers like myself, we've been doing hand-to-hand combat driving stuff organically for such a long time, organ- driving like results and revenue organically, whether it's on Amazon or off Amazon, but never had to do this pay to play model that Amazon utilizes now, which is PPC. And I think that's problematic for a lot of them, a lot of merchants that aren't, aren't used to that. Like they weren't used to spending and figuring out what your return on ad spend is and how much? What's your? How am I going to structure my PPC spend across all my products? If you have 800 products, and how are you going to create those campaigns on a per product basis, or you're going to do it on a category basis? So, there's so much that needs to happen that how the sausage was made at those times in this past 10 years isn't how the sausage is made today, and you need to innovate and change. And sellers need to now be advertisers as well, and that adds a layer of complexity that I think most aren't used to. Right. There And plus, you know, with a multi-channel play, people are selling on big channels like Walmart and eBay, uh, Wish, also through Shopify. And that's, you know, like covering those grant, like those bases doesn't seem to be enough anymore. Like you said, you sell on like 10 sales channels now. How do you kind of learn the differences and the specific specificities of each sales channel in terms of organically ranking in terms of you know what is successful on Amazon isn't necessarily successful on Walmart so how do you kind of learn about that or you know with all of this information do you just start outsourcing that kind of knowledge yeah so i think that's a really good point is like what drives great results on Amazon with a plus content and enriched brand content you're looking for the crappiest content, F plus content on eBay. And eBay is using their titles more for ranking than Amazon is. And Amazon's looking for buyer frequency and buyer signals and add to carts and checkout and conversions. So I think it just happens to be like learning. I think number one is like seeing, being on the ground floor, creating these listings, seeing what's working. I think is also talking to other individuals, like surrounding yourself by really smart people who have been there, done that is also helpful. So whether it's masterminding with them, just reaching out, being like, hey, I heard you on a podcast. I want to talk. I think building that muscle of talking to other people is super important. And like your community that you're in. Like at Stubana, we actually have our own Slack community called Run D to C, which by the way, if you email me at chat at Stubana, I'm happy to to bring you into the fold. But like right now, more than ever with, with the pandemic, you need to create community and lean on each other to help each other. And that's what we're trying to create. What other suggestions do you kind of have for people, you know, to learn to learn these like very nuanced things about other marketplaces that isn't necessarily present right away in like YouTube or Google search? Yeah, like I think there's... There's a lot of quote unquote gurus out there who have like probably couldn't make it as you know those who can't do teach those who can't teach inspect. I think there's a lot of those that are out there today, uh, specifically in the econ world. So you have to be really careful of who you're learning from. Uh, but I would actually just go and do it, right? Like go and like create a listing, see how it works, look at the data behind it, and analyze it, and then come to your own conclusion. I don't know. I think that's a great way. And then like, yeah, okay. Putting yourself out there, joining communities, watching webinars, being in the chat, seeing who's smart and who's, who's coming up with interesting opinions to like befriend those individuals. I think that's, that's a great strategy. Right. And definitely sounds like a lot of work. So you're a marketer. Um, you kind of do your, you excel at that front. So at what point do you outsource other arms of your company, of your business to other people? Yeah. Um, it's all about, I, I, I think you have to wear the hat and then give the job away. And that happens sometimes on a weekly basis, sometimes on a monthly basis. Uh, but you need to do it and then give it away. Or 
if you have the budget, right, go and find someone who has the core competency to do it and, and get it done yourself. And so I guess you can look at this in a, in a matrix style way, which is like, what's going to have the highest impact where I should be spending my time and like having a bucket list and then having a, an effort list, right? A list of like the things that you absolutely don't want to do or you don't like doing that you know that it doesn't, you're not passionate about it. You're not good at it. And this is definitely something that you can give to somebody else. For example, PPC, right? For pay-per-click on Amazon. Like we have a huge budget, huge campaign. It's a huge time suck. And like I can find somebody to do that far better than I can do it and spend my time and and have a much bigger impact on the company. So I think so I think like wearing the hat, finding what you're good at, finding what you hate at, outsourcing it. I'm using Upwork uh, pretty often. I'm also like using my own network of connections to come up with who we should be hiring. Uh, but yeah. Do you also take advantage of that the virtual assistant network as well for admin related tasks? Yeah, for sure. I actually so I started off using VAs in the Philippines. Uh, we still have those VAs internally, like they've grown at the company. And then, but yeah, I'm I'm all about like picking, like finding, like you can find a generalist who can help you, and then find so you're hiring for specific generalist roles, and then hiring for the secret sauce or the secret weapon that that person holds. Like PPC is a specific function, but like answering email is more of a generalist function. And uh, but yeah, we we and we give by the way, at our like some companies and give out like organic lunch or give out t-shirts to their staff, we give to our employees virtual assistants to help them. Essentially, it becomes leverage. So we give everyone a VA so they can essentially do what they're great at and get rid of some of these repetitive tasks with support functions at the company. And which company gets the VAs? Well, I mean, at Scubana, for example, like all, most of our employees have VAs or departments have VAs to help them out. Uh, at Crucial, we have a ton of VAs helping us with customer support and everything else to help us get the. We only, I only have one employee at Think Crucial right now, which is insane because we're a seven figure business. Uh, but we let technology like Stubana automate it. And then we have VAs to outsource and get leverage for those tasks that we can't automate. And then I have one individual that's a COO, Kristen, who is literally driving strategy and driving the impact, doing higher value activities. Wow. Okay. So you have one full-time employee at Think Crucial and the rest is like virtual assistants. How many virtual assistants do you have at Think Crucial? I want to say we have like five roughly. Wow. So that kind of is like a secret sauce that I feel like a lot of people don't look into. And where do you, where do you scope these people out? Like, how do you find them? So I use, I mean, you can hit me up in an email. I mean, I, I, I started off doing Upwork and now I use a company called Tache. Uh, but yeah, we, we, so we source those individuals through those areas. Mm, okay. So I'm going to start diving into questions that people have submitted and want to ask you. So um, let's go through the steps that someone should take to start diversifying because you've really stressed the importance of going multi-channel. And right now, I feel like it's you know being viewed as a mystifying sort of territory. So what is a diversification tactic that you recommend people? Any specific order, how would they start that process? How they diversify the products or diversify their channels? Diversify their channels off of Amazon. Okay. So one is I would create your own website right away. And I would start testing that, uh, shipping that immediately as possible, and testing different channels. Now, if you close your eyes and you think, hmm, vacuum filters and coffee filters, Home Depot, that's a really good channel. Yeah, no, Sephora, probably not a good channel. So it depends on your category. You have to really think about your category and think about where you can capture more market share and more eyeballs. And maybe it's Instagram. Like people go to Instagram or Facebook to check out, right? They don't go in to, to be like, hey, I want to replace my vacuum filter. Like I need to be reminded of the chores I need to do in my house. Like I need to do my laundry. They don't want that. What they do want is they want to check out and they want a place to go where they can maybe see something different or unique. And so, like, I don't. We don't advertise on Facebook or, or Instagram. It's never been a great channel for us. We have tried it. It's just never worked out. But certain categories are great at it. And so especially right now, by the way, where the cost per click is really down, um, it's a great opportunity to test and also get market share, brand recognition as well. 
uh, in these in these other channels outside of Amazon. So like starting in Amazon, so starting starting on Amazon is great. Ending is not great, and you need to find a different channel. And I would start by closing your eyes, thinking about where people are dwelling, where you think your demographic is spending their time and attention, and go after it. That's interesting. So coffee filters didn't do well on Instagram. So we made replacement filters, right, that are specific to your coffee unit. So like if you have a Chemex or an Aeropress or a specific espresso machine, it's so specific that you can't just be like, hey. We don't have every single coffee filter that's made on the market. We only have specific ones that are very niche that there's an opportunity to make money on where the margins haven't been eroded. So to answer your 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 question is like, no, our product category is very unique in that way. However, if I came up with my own coffee unit, that might be a great, a great opportunity to capitalize on just the coffee enthusiast that's on Instagram that wants a new brew method. Do you think you'll ever expand your business into that area then? See, the thing is, I think it's already done, right? I think it's been there, done that. And so if it's been already created, unless I'm solving a problem, then I don't see that there's an opportunity. Unless I'm like, let's just, let me put out a great idea for someone to steal, which would be like nitro coffee. I freaking love nitro. You don't drink coffee, so you can't get excited about this, but like, I love nitro coffee. There is not one nitro coffee maker, like prosumer or on the market right now. So I need to go to Whole Foods and buy my Stumptown Nitro Cold Brew if I want that nitro flavor. So like, to me, that's a problem. I'm experiencing it in real time. There's no solve for it right now. And I believe that that's an opportunity to capture. Now, why don't I do it? I'm super busy running Stubana. You're selling in a multitude of channels. Where? What are your future plans? Where do you want to go next? Well, right now we're focusing on, we already have the channel strategy down. I think that the next thing that we're working on is high margin, innovative products that nobody could replicate or compete with us on. That's where we've been spending most of our time. I would say the other place that we're spending time is like doing joint ventures. So like I mentioned earlier, finding other people, like we make these, we make filter media for masks, for pockets, going out and finding people that are actually making the masks. Just like now everybody and their grandmother is making a mask right now. And they're not that efficient, by the way, unless you actually have a filter filter media in it. Yeah. So just finding very creative ways to kind of tap into other markets in so little words, basically. Yep. New products and like adjacent markets going with this collaboration strategy. So you mentioned earlier, find where just pretty much discern what the customer journey is and where your buyers are lurking, where they find their products. Um, are there any, so are there any like specific tactics that you recommend, like, you know, maybe even like buyer, like surveys or anything to find out more about the customer? Because marketing is all about defining the buyer persona and who your customer is. How do you kind of put their hat on and step in their shoes as someone who's behind a business behind, you know, in the weeds all the time? Like, how do you do that? I mean, there's a ton of data that you can peruse from Google to understand the demographic and how, like how people are finding you. What's your conversions? What's the bounce rate? What's their age? What browser are they using? Are they on a mobile, on a tablet, on a desktop? So like you start there. And then by the way, there's apps on Shopify, for example, that you can leverage that like you can pop up after the checkout asking them to be like, How did you hear about us? Or there's pop-ups that you have on the landing page itself that are essentially asking specific questions to learn more about the customer. So I think those are opportunities where you can, and live chat is a great place to find find out even more about the customer. Because like customers love that, like that interaction in real time. Right. They love live chat. And for someone who has limited capital and is strapped for cash, how would you... I guess, what would that strategy be for you to kind of start your own business? Because you were probably once in that situation, building Think Crucial. What metrics should they keep in mind? And should they, I guess, like, what should their advertising strategy be? Well, I think that they should do a ton of research up front. So there's a lot of tools you can use for research and competitive intelligence tools. You need to make sure you're scratching an itch that you have. I'd go back to this idea of like solving a problem. 
you need to make sure that you're solving a specific problem. Now you can launch a website really quickly, a uh, shopping cart like Shopify, launch it, do some spend, some limited spend. It could be a small little budget and just see how people are interacting with your site, see what the conversions have been, see what your returns are. I, Tim Ferriss wrote a book and it's still a classic, The 4-Hour Workweek, where he literally goes and tests this really quickly. He even tested the title of his book with PPC ads. And that's how he came up with his the, name, the title of his book. So I'm a huge believer in just like trying to ship it super quick, doing the research up front and just learning from those mistakes before you invest a whole lot of money, sweat, which could inevitably create a lot of tears. You need to make sure you're putting in that investment up front of time and effort before you go ahead and put money in. Would you say that it's feasible to kind of work on something like this part-time or should you kind of go hand, you know, all in like you did? Well, luckily, by the way, I did, I did do a little moonlighting back in the day uh, where I would like have my day job on wall street and then work the night shift and like build something. Cause I was like super passionate about it. I got like so into building the website and doing all the HTML. So I started doing this all at the same time. So like things look like they they appear to be an overnight success or they appear to happen quickly. Like these things take a long time to build and optimize on. How long would you say that it pretty much took you to create the building blocks, I guess, of your first business? It's never done. Like, but yeah, it took, uh, so like I was laid off Friday, the 13th of February, 2009, which was, by the way, it was two weeks after I proposed to my wife. Like, I was like, oh, now's the best time. I'm, I'm sad. I'm stable. I've got a good job. I'm going to propose now. And two weeks after I got laid off. So super, like, it's never a good time, which is why I'm always like, just go do it. And it took so much time. Like there were so many learning mistakes and like, you just have to be ready for the roller coaster and ready for the adventure because there's going to be a lot of pain, but there's also going to be a lot of healing and a lot of adventure and excitement and fun. You just have to be ready for it. And, and yeah, it's great. And so like, there's never, you're never done, right? Nobody's ever, at least entrepreneurs that I know are never done. There's like the business that you have at the time and there's the business that you're in and there's the business that you're becoming and evolving into. What would you say is the biggest reason that people don't want to get onto other channels or expand their business? Um, is it due to a lack of knowledge, lack of courage, or what else do you, what else do you usually see? Comfortability. It's easy, especially if you're doing really well, like happiness. They say happiness dulls the senses. And I think just getting into a rhythm and getting comfortable, that's really it. Like they're making money, it's a cash cow, but that's not, it's not, it, it, that cash cow today may not be the cash cow of tomorrow. Like even with this whole pandemic that happened, I'm sure Deliver had a tremendous amount of success. Like FBA closed down. People couldn't ship their products to FBA, so they need to pivot to FBM. If you didn't actually have the foresight to think about having a 3PL or being diversified or having multiple different warehouses, you could not execute on your strategy. You were SOL, right? And so we committed at Think Crucial to, to omnipresence and being everywhere really early on, not just every channel, right? But thinking about our SKU and the calories of our SKUs and thinking about our warehouse proportion, where they are in the United States. Like we don't just have one warehouse, we have two. I wanna be able to actually ship to anywhere in the United States within two days shipping without actually having to pay for two days shipping. And we now have a footprint that enables us to do that. So like, uh, I think that people should be thinking about this way in advance and having this kind of uh, foresight to, act, to to just like move the needle forward in their business, right? And you need to be doing things that others aren't willing to do to succeed. So you want two-day delivery essentially come nationwide for Think Crucial? You're kind of aiming for that now? Yeah, we're aiming for that. But also, by the way, not just when you actually create a footprint of multi-warehouses, you get shorter lead time. So you can actually bring market product to market quicker. Your shipping costs are that much cheaper and you deliver a better experience to the customer. Why not use Deliver? We actually just started using Deliver actually. It's just another warehouse for us. Think Cruiser just started using, uh, we, we're just about to start getting products. I think we picked our top 10 listings on, I think we're focusing on Walmart's channel specifically just to have a test. Again, I'm all about testing. So I can't say whether or not, you know, there's an algorithm 
change or prioritization on Walmart unless I actually use, like I can hear about it, I can learn about it, but I want to actually put my feet in the water and see if it's warm. Right. Dip your toes into the water, see if, if it works out for you and then scale up from there. You are obviously, you know, like leveraging a bunch of different marketplaces, kind of controlling for headwinds that happen, like Amazon restrictions, stuff like that. In the future, just a future facing question, what changes do you foresee in the e-commerce ecosystem in the next year or next five years? That's really fascinating. Uh, I think that there is going to be, so like right now, what happens is there's friction in the process. And anytime there's friction or a problem, there's an opportunity. And so right now what's happening is that a lot of individuals are finding brands through Instagram and Facebook. And essentially what they're needing to do then is then transition from Instagram as discovery to a shopping cart and going through the checkout process. And I do believe that there's going to be a time when these marketplaces become the actual e-commerce platform because they already own the eyeballs. I look forward to seeing like what happens and develops there with Instagram has something called shop. It's new, it's still p being piloted, but I think that's something that's going to happen in the future. I mean, I could geek out on a lot of other things that are happening in the software space, but specifically as it relates to like brands and marketplaces specifically, I think that Instagram could create a really nice opportunity for itself to compete with Amazon if they do it correctly. And how about Google? Google just waived all their fees for their for their uh, Google checkout process. So I think that's helpful to like, gain more momentum. But they're kind of always just way behind where the puck is going. Uh, and so uh, right, unless they make an acquisition, I think that they're going to be always in, in second or third. So Instagram kind of carries all of that potential right now because it is a massive point of discovery, you're saying, for a lot of potential buyers. And then it's just a really good opportunity to try to convert people kind of at that stage. Yeah, I think like the point of inception or discovery is where you can really capitalize on the sale. And right now driving to a separate shopping store or shopping cart, like Amazon used to drive people, they had something called Amazon PLAs, product listing ads. And Amazon used to drive you off Amazon to the shopping cart and they stopped that. So I think Instagram has an opportunity to do it. I think Facebook, there's some Facebook fatigue happening, but I think they can do it. Pinterest has this opportunity as well. Uh, TikTok, I think that they're going to either close down or get acquired right now, but they could have actually had this opportunity. And then you have someone like Shopify who now has all this mass information of brand data that they can leverage and maybe create their own marketplace as well. So I think that's where it's going is there has to be someone, some sort of aggregator that comes in that sort of, you go to Amazon, you go there to buy toilet paper or to buy paper towels. And you go to Instagram to check out and to learn and discover new products. Like, I don't know when the last time I went onto Amazon to just like scroll and learn something new. So I think there's an opportunity there. That's so interesting that you mentioned Pinterest. I remember using Pinterest in my like early middle school days. So it, it you know, it's a very kind of old platform. And Casey Goss um, from Viral Launch, she also mentioned that too, Pinterest, um, as being a really, really good place to look next. So can you kind of describe like what the discovery process would be for a buyer on Pinterest and how that would, um, I guess, what would that process look like in integration with your marketplace? Yeah, so... Pinterest, so let's just say that we are adding a new floor to my house and we're renovating the house. So my wife would go ahead and create a, uh, a wall, or I forgot what they call it exactly, but essentially a, a board of all the items that she wants in the new living room that's being created, right? So she pins all these things, you click on the image, and then that drives you off of Pinterest to the website or the blog that the image is from. But imagine if now Pinterest can say, "Hey, you pin this. This is a you want this for your for your new house. Buy it here. Save ten percent." So instead of driving the checkout elsewhere, you're just removing a bottleneck in the process, making it like less a lot less friction in the process to check out. So I think that's how it would look. And by the way, Pinterest has a really interesting demographic, right? Their their demographic is mostly women, from what I've read, and uh, 
it's somewhere between like 20 to 45 roughly. And so if you're, you're like, maybe vacuum filters may not be a good fit there, but maybe coffee filters would be a really good fit because they're iconic and you can take photos of them and, and cherish those moments. And so again, just thinking about what marketplace is going to drive the highest amount of ROI for the product category and the products that you have is really important. Cool. So that's awesome um, that you've thought about that. I feel like Pinterest is kind of coming back again. I actually used Pinterest to redecorate my room. So that's a very, it's kind of related back. And so you bought, but you bought those products not on Pinterest, correct? Not on Pinterest. I bought it on Wayfair. Are you, and did the link drive you to Wayfair? Is that how you discovered it? I believe, yeah. I believe the link drove me back to Wayfair. Either that or led me to a blogger's website where she mentioned that she bought it on Wayfair and that's how I discovered the product. So final words of wisdom. Do you have any for us? Um, any closing words? Uh, I, mean, I think this was a really awesome podcast. You did a great job on asking uh, all the right questions, pulling it all out of me. Uh, I think I think we've covered it. I think uh, you know if we're talking about just like people starting out or people diversifying, I think you just have to get really passionate. Like your business, especially in the early days, has to become an extension of you, and like you're going to need more than just like the will to just like make a lot of money to survive. You're going to need to have other things that are driving your motivation. And I think that's for me in the early days, like when I was working and burning the midnight fuel, like my drive was, yeah, I want to succeed, but like, hey, this is really fun and this is awesome to build something new. And it just like, I should have been studying for the CFA exam. And instead I was like learning how to adjust the website template. And it was, it was a really fun time. Yeah. And like, I guess, like, do you kind of mind giving us some of like your resources? You can like email them over to me, but like books you've read, things you find inspiring just to. Yeah. So I'll just, um, t- so lightning around that- here. Uh, let's see. Shoe Dog, great book. Uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Amazing book. Top one of 2019 for me. Uh, I just got done with uh, The Messy Middle, Scott Belsky, uh, who essentially started. Uh, what did he start? Um, the uh, he's a software entrepreneur. Uh, he sold his business. Uh, and uh, Behance, that's it. Behance. And so those are some books, um, podcasts. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm I'm really enjoying Noah Kagan's podcast. I think it's a a fun one to listen to. It gives me a lot of inspiration. I always learn something new. I really like his interview questions. It has nothing to do with e-commerce, really. It's just uh, something I like to listen to. And so those are books and that's, and like just literally joining communities and groups, right? Learning from a lot of people, picking their brain, uh, sending them like an Uber lunch, especially in these times to just have, you know, be like, Hey, I'll pay for lunch. I'll send it to you. If I can give, if I can get 15 minutes of your time, I think those are, those are win-wins for, for everybody. And you make a really nice acquaintance along the way. I also wrote a book, by the way, called Cheaper, Easier, Direct. So if you are just starting out, that's a really good book to tap into. Of course, it's on Amazon. And then uh, lastly, you can email me if you have any questions at chat at Skubana. If you ever want to have a jam sesh, that's where you can reach me. That's my personal contact information. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chad, for joining me today. A lot of really great insights, a lot of great resources. I'm sure a lot of people could really take action from this podcast. Thank you, Selena. I appreciate it. All right, guys, that's all for today. Looks like we all need to take a page out of Chad Rubin's playbook and start treating your businesses like a monopoly game in the wild world of e-commerce. Today, you can activate inventory management platform Skubana with your Deliver account. Go to deliver.com slash integrations slash Skubana, S-K-U-B-A-N-A. If you're interested in learning the latest tips and tricks and deep dives on how to become a successful online seller, dive into our blog to learn more. To do that, visit deliver.com slash blog.